Welcome everybody to this edition of Beers with Bill. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the show Aaron Spinney from Merritt Brewing. He's the head brewer and co-founder. Stepping in for Taz, who had an opportunity to travel and visit his parents and couldn't quite make the connection to be back here on time. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So we're going to start with Brave Noise tonight, are we? Yeah, we're going to start with Brave Noise. Uh, we'll kind of work our way through it uh, from like the hop, the hoppy stuff and then go kind of increase the alcohol from there. So <laughs> we'll start at the low pale ale and, and kind of build our way up. So yeah, uh, Brave Noise is a worldwide collaboration that uh, has been brought forth, I believe mid to late last year. Um, so far, you know, uh, a few hundred breweries have brewed this beer and you know it was kind of one of those things where once you apply um, everything is kind of on your plate to to brew the beer it is a uh, sorry let me let me think about this how to say it properly um, it is a a collaboration that just wants to bring forth the the troubles that the brewing industry has had with equality and diversity and really uh just bring light to that and also just bring the breweries together to to show what uh sorry the dog wants to chime in there um what the breweries are about the code of conduct and the the space itself and you know what you're about in in terms of uh just loving everyone and, and wanting to to have a, a better industry overall so this beer is to bring awareness to that and and we also donated to a local uh company uh, group that we work with a lot called Sasha Hamilton um, and it's a group for uh, exposing abuse and and just like a, a loving space as well so yeah we teamed up with them to to donate all the proceeds to this beer to that and yeah it's a very basic uh, pale ale nice wheat forward base and then just some sabro hops and mosaic so from the sabro you're going to get a little bit of pineapple little coconut, some more tropical notes, and then the mosaic itself, you'll get a little citrus tone, some some orange peel, and, and just a nice light kind of uh, springtime in a glass, if you will. So I'm curious, you went to Mohawk and, and Tej was a, a graduate at McMaster. So how did you guys actually connect? Yeah, um, kind of one of those things where it was uh, a few degrees of separation at first, but a few of my friends in high school ended up being on his floor at McMaster. And throughout the years of going, you know, Upper Mountain and downtown here, uh, we became friends and kind of uh, went our own ways for a long time. And he went into his music uh, industry stuff, and I was taken the long haul in the brewing industry and about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, he was starting to show a little bit more interest in cooking and, and, and brewing and stuff. And I was helping him design some homebrew recipes at the time that were, you know, too convoluted and too complex. And I was kind of making them a little bit more simple for him and I guess the results showed. So he was happy to uh, keep the conversation going. And we started working on this project in 2014 and then we opened our doors in 2017. So it was about three years of, you know, afternoons and evenings and weekends and stuff like that, trying to get all the, the business plan together to really build, um, I guess, what merit is today. That's uh, almost like a normal time frame for people to open a brewery. Three yeah, years. yeah, for sure. What was that? Um, what was it like the first time you walked into the space where merit is now? Oh, I still look at photos on my phone and like, wow, look at this. This was cool. It was, uh, it was eye opening. You know, at first, it was just a big, big rectangle. Of course, uh, this building was a, a from ground up build. So it took ten months from the first shovel in the ground to the first brew, pretty much to the day, which was pretty eye opening and very cool to be a part of. Um, the building itself was about 5,000 square feet with a roof of 32 feet up. So really just a hollow, hollow shell for quite a while. And it was hard to imagine it, but 
slowly but surely the walls came up and the you know the brew house started to come in and yeah I don't know it was it was just a exciting yet stressful time where you know you just wanted to start jumping in the pool and getting your feet wet I'm glad you said it that way because there's that romance around being a brewery owner and all the excitement and enjoy but people forget the stress and the anxiety and and the hard work that goes in before you actually get your first brew out the door oh yeah yeah it was nuts uh it was a, a ball of nerves you know I, I the only thing i wasn't really worried about i guess was the recipes at the time everything else i was just worried about how clean everything had to be and just really wanted to put my best foot forward and even being in the brewing industry at that time for six years i felt like i was starting over and had something to like reprove not only to myself but to my friends and to the industry so it was kind of like starting all over and at that point you know like who what was merit and who cares as well so it was really having to put your best foot forward and that meant sleepless nights and 20 hour days and seven days a week for like almost two to three years and as well I was the only brewer at the time and in, in merit so I was doing everything from making the beer you know to packaging everything in between and then also kind of being the uncle dad of like fixing every fa leaky faucet and broken things so you know it's, just, it's what you do but it, it, it's a labor of love for sure. Now, I, I read something in, a, in an interview that you had done with somebody about being in Hamilton. So you're an agri boy by, by birth. I am. Yeah, I'm born and raised well. I'm third generation Welland, actually. I don't know if that's a good thing, but that, it's life. <laughs> Welland's an interesting town. Yeah, it's got good pizza. And that's, I guess, kind of as far as it goes. <laughs> you made allusions to that in that interview. Uh, yeah yeah i talk about pizza a lot <laughs> and um you said something about history and food connect all of us yeah and how's that describe the values of merit and you and tej particularly oh i think uh also another early quote that i said that we put on the wall is you never grow old around the dinner table and you know through stories and friendship and, and the food you eat you you feel like a child forever you know is uh you're always remembering you know whoever cooked for you growing up whether it was your grandmother or grandfather or mother or father or just family in general you know those those times are special to people you know unfortunately as well not everyone gets to experience that but through restaurants and through our experience we really want to like incorporate that and showcase that loveliness and welcomeness um of course i think like you learn so much um through like culinary culture and, and history i think it, it does all connect us right whether you're eating with wonder bread or flatbread it all kind of stems from the same historic growth over the, the planet and I, I think it's fascinating and brewing it alone shows that with um just regional brewing and, and where you brew on different continents, right? It, it depends on where you're from is what you're using in terms of grain and fruit and, and bitters and all that, all that stuff in between, the, even the water, right? Is uh, very terroir like, you know, winery speak of terroir of the local soil and wind and water. And as a brewery, you know, we don't really get that as we're filtering Hamilton water, you know, that's kind of our terroir, but it still makes us unique and special to even Toronto on the other side of the lake. What was the attraction to come back to Hamilton? Oh, I, you know, it, Hamilton was just a place that was far enough away from home that I could still go see my mom and dad. And, uh, you know, they would, I could go do laundry on weekends, but it, it quickly grew on me from, I think just the local history and, and very beautiful area. Obviously when you're, in your college days you don't really care about the facades of buildings but the history of it was always cool and like just that blue collar worker and like i just have a connection with the town growing up in a blue collar family but i didn't really connect with it that much until i moved to halifax and when i was doing my internship there at garrison it really connected um because of the local support seeing that i love hamilton or i love halifax symbol in people's front windows and in every storefront and not just seeing big box stores survive but you know the local mom and pop shop and 
Hamilton has obviously been through a very rough patch, but it's kind of one of those things that a lot of amazing historical things have survived and very cool, very cool, like mom and pop food shops and, you know, butcher shops. There's a really, a really big uh, Italian, old Italian neighborhood here, Portuguese. And then now, of course, as we get into the modern day, we just have such a lovely mix of like, culture and food and i think that's what it was was just like the local support everyone everyone should and and hopefully can support each other with you know just even a hello and as rusty as people are here you know salty on the east coast you walk by each other and still say hi and it's just you know it's a nice place i totally understand that that's my favorite aspect of because I have land out in Nova Scotia where I plan to retire. You wave at everybody as they yeah. drive by you. Oh, yeah. Like when I go see my parents, if I stop in the grocery store before I get home to pick something up, they know that I like whose kid I am and where, you know, where I'm going. And someone mentioned it two weeks ago, you know, but yeah, Hamilton, it's a, it's a bigger version of that. Of course, you know, we're looking at almost close, like getting up to 600,000 people and it's going to continue to grow. So that's also an interesting thing to see. Uh, COVID's really pushed that forward fast, which is really interesting as well. And, you know, it hopefully isn't going to start losing those little gems and those hidden, you know, you have to find it kind of places because that's what made it special. And obviously that's what people want to move here for. But with uh, with growth, com- growth comes value of the land and it's, it, it's harder and harder for those shops to, to exist too. But we try and... Uh, try and support as much as we can for sure. I, we, uh, we believe in like community over competition. That's kind of our, our big focus. Well, the area that you guys are in is quite a clustered community. There's a, a number of very unique shops along that street. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of, you know, it's interesting because opening a brew pub downtown in a city is kind of the anchor for gentrification. And it's one of those things that, you know, you can't really avoid. And, and it's not something that we want to avoid or pretend like it's not happening. We just want to be a part of it in the proper way where it's not offsetting people. It's not pushing people away. It's still allowing everyone to survive and coexist within a, a space that is obviously going to get more and more crammed, but hopefully we can all, you know, work together and live together and keep growing that way in the positive. Well, from the last time when I was there and talking with Tej about in the back patio, there's a tremendous amount of development going on around you. Oh my goodness. Yeah, absolutely. And we're still seeing projects explode everywhere. It's hard to keep track. Like, you know, working in the brewery and going home over COVID, sometimes you forgot to look around you and now there's so much change even from the start of it all to, to now, you know, and, it's wild. I can hear you in that one. Uh, just got to go back and get a quick question. Someone here says, curious that he heard that ordering pizza in the Niagara region, you order by the number of slices, not the size. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Uh, a lot of times in well, and you also just like order party trays. So you're just getting like a Nona cookie tray full of like a rectangle pie, usually like 21 to 24 slices, depending on who's cutting it, you know. But yeah, yeah, eight slice, 10 slice, like I, I've seen that. There's a place called the Rex Hotel. Um, it's coming up on, I think about 118 years old. I could be wrong, maybe 115 uh, since they started. They started making pizza in 1933, but before that they were an ice cream shop. So they kind of consider that still part of their their time, like 20 or 30 years before that. So it's really incredible. Um, it's like on their fifth, fourth or fifth generation now. And a bunch of guys that we went to high school with but uh, yeah, that's what they do. You get a you get an eight slice with a, a ten piece wings, and that's kind of their the Rex special. But highly recommend it if if you like OV, especially. <laughs> that's the town that drinks most of it, you know. <laughs> well, we are talking Welland and Blue Collar. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is also it's also uh, the only other thing to claim to fame is it's a big hockey town. Uh, I believe it's in the NHL Hall of Fame for some of the most hockey players drafted to the NHL, which is pretty cool. That is really cool. I don't, I can barely spell hockey, so that's you know that's not me, but uh, it, it does it does exist there. 
You mean you weren't out on the Welling Canal when it was frozen playing hockey? Oh, I, I played, I played, I played some pond puck, but nothing, uh, nothing that was going to get me anywhere near even a real ice rink, you know. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's go to Albion Falls now. Yeah, let's try it out. So Albion Falls um, is, I believe, the second of a waterfall series that we've kind of created. The, the problem with running a brew pub is we release one to two beers a week uh, just be, and over COVID it's been a little bit different, but as we get back to a normal or regular service in the, in the tap room, the need for that volume is there. So we're, we're releasing this week, we're releasing two beers and actually one of them is a new waterfall series. The nice thing about Hamilton, I believe is it's the capital or sorry, the waterfall capital of Canada and it has more waterfalls per capita than anywhere else in this country. And it's essentially because of the escarpment that we have here, but the adjustments over the landscape over time, waterfall water still got to go down. Right. So um, there's, I think over 36 waterfalls. So coming up with a beer every week and, you know, usually about a hoppy beer every month, at least one of them, it gets exhausting trying to figure out what to call these beers. And like, if it's just an IPA, you know, uh, a salad, a salad, whether it's a, gar a house salad or a Caesar, right? But you're still in that salad category. And IPAs are important on the menu for many different reasons, but they get exhausting to name. So we've been trying to find series or different ways to name our product. And the waterfall is one of them. So Albion Falls is a beautiful waterfall here in town. And uh, we just kind of started with that one. And Actually, this Friday, we have Tiffany Falls coming out as well. So that's going to be a nice, uh, fresh spring release. But Albion Falls is uh, Belma Hops, Talus, and Citra. Uh, we've never used Belma or Talus before, and we just kind of wanted to start painting with different colors. This one as well, uh, because of the opens and closes and shutdowns and all this stuff, uh, it's been really hard to navigate packaging. Packaging, you know, on a regular basis for us is about a thousand bottles, but over COVID, some batches have gone up to 3000 bottles and, you know, the, the peaks and valleys of sales and, and online orders and stuff, along with the retail shop have been hard to navigate. So sometimes we're packaging a little bit more than usual. Uh, so this beer was uh, kind of in the middle of the, the shutdown. So we didn't have any draft sales. So we we're like, okay, let's package a lot of this and it really held well in the bottle. I think you get a nice, like creamy citrus coming off of it, but very balanced, nothing too bitter. Uh, we're not really aiming for bitterness much these days. Uh, we do have some old school beers coming out for our anniversary next month, but we can, we can talk about that later. <laughs> <coughs> how, do you how do you decide what to brew? At first, it used to be <clears throat> kind of what what we were feeling or what what the menu, what we thought the menu needed. In the beginning, it felt like a lot of one-offs, and, and we still do a lot of project brews. Um, a lot of times, I think, in a culinary mind as well. So I'm trying to mimic flavors that I've experienced in the kitchen or that we, you know, we play around with. But uh, seasonally, really matters, especially over like five years. We, you know, this is actually our fifth anniversary, which is wild. And to think about how fast time flies, it, you know, everyone tells you how fast it does, but it doesn't slow down, right? So for us now, after hitting five years, I've been talking to a lot of people and I've seen it at other places as well. It, sorry, I was at Sawdust for three years and saw the same thing similar happen where a beer that's so close to your heart and something that you work on consistently and try and tweak the minor things that maybe no one else is gonna notice eventually that beer no longer belongs to you. you. You don't own that beer anymore. You might've created the recipe, but it owns, to, it, it, it belongs to the drinkers. It belongs to the people that come to the bar and people that enjoy it in our space and hopefully at home as well. And that's our goal overall is to make sure that people enjoy the product. Um, you know, whether you think it's an art form or a craft or just temporary, I believe it's temporary consumable art. And the whole idea behind it is like, how can you stay creative? How can you stay relevant and how can you keep learning? So for us, uh, for myself and my one brewer, that's really what we push each other to do is 
if there's a style that we haven't brewed before i'm famously known to not make english beers and it's kind of something that has fallen on our palates over the last two years so we've really been focusing on traditional styles um lagers as well have really taken the forefront in craft brewing uh something that i've always really enjoyed making and Luckily, uh, my dad's always hounding me about drinking IPAs. He, he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't like that stuff. So he's like, oh, make me a lawnmower beer. I want a lawnmower beer. So my goal is to make sure that uh, Brucey, my dad, is happy drinking loggers, cutting the grass in Cape Breton, you know, whether or chopping logs, whatever he's doing from the day to day. But he's always, he's always hounding me for lawnmower beers. So, you know, that's kind of my inspiration on that side. But um, over COVID as well, I think... It really caused us to ask the question, um, what are we what are we known for? As a brew pub, just having a restaurant setting where people come in and we can just pick the menu, rotate it around ten different beers at most of the time. Uh, you know, you have a good array and a good good reflection of like hopefully brewing skill. But over COVID, we didn't have that. We had to reduce our volume. We cut our brews about fifty uh, percent as well. And we really had to hard look, take a hard look at what beers fit, what beers are something that we're proud of, what beers do we want to like brew again and again, and also how do we build a reputation around things? You know, uh, I really like our IPAs. I don't think many people think about Merritt as an IPA brewery. Um, another category was we broke it down into about five categories. So we've got our hoppy, hop focused beers. We have our sour lines. Um, traditional styles so like our English stuff stouts and lagers our wine hybrids which is our main focus uh, of course those are only seasonal but producing them versus releasing them kind of takes all year as well so we do trickle our hybrids uh, throughout the year as well and then uh, well else? I'm forgetting one other one. Oh my goodness I talk about this all the time. And then of course, when you have to like show your mom how to do a cartwheel, you can't do it, you know? Oh, and then yeah, dark beers. So dark beers, not just like stouts kind of range between traditional styles and the dark stuff. Of course, obviously a stout is dark, but you know, we, we, we did a, a beer called beneath the noise. That's a dry Irish stout. And it was something that we just wanted to have similar to a Guinness in a way, uh, and it was a challenge to ourselves and we're really happy with it. We've released it two or three times now. We're going to ho hopefully keep pushing that in the fall as well. But uh, yeah, that's kind of how we choose now. We have five different categories. And then on top of that, it's uh, what do we want to brew? I guess. Yeah. It's, it's just kind of that it goes around in a circle as I am right now. Uh, what do we feel like doing? And then of course, seasonal brews. Uh, we just tomorrow's that we're going to try soon. That's a beer that comes out the first week of spring and and eventually that kind of dictates how you brew and what you need to brew and also we we like the, we like these bring these beers back because they're fun and heck we like drinking them as well so you you have uh, some space constraints there so you're not likely doing a barrel program are you no we started doing the barrel program and for some reason uh at the beginning when i was doing everything it it was easy uh, for like the first six barrels <laughs> and then eventually it becomes a full-time job. So we ended up right now at the warehouse, we're looking at, uh, we, we're doing some renovations and we're going to start downsizing, but we have 52 barrels at the warehouse right now. About 14 of them are wine barrels that were pre wine hybrid program. And then on top of that, most of them were just like old bourbon barrels and tequila barrels that we just can't use anymore. So we want to bring back, uh, we did a tequila barrel aged beer that we're really proud of. And I want to bring that back one day, but that's only going to be like eight barrels. And then we're hoping to start bringing some barrels in uh, when we have some time and space to just complement the barrel or sorry, the uh, wine hybrid program. So the wine hybrids are something that we focus on in the, in the fall time when harvest is happening in Niagara. And in the last two years we've released uh annually we've done eight beers eight or nine beers every year so it's something that we're really pushing we know a lot of people don't do that do that but also not too many people are on the cusp of niagara with the ability to use uh fresh fruit from that day right so we're happy to do that but yeah it's uh it's a doozy <laughs> 
So I'm going to ask Terry's question, which is, what beer have you tried from another brewery where you have literally said, damn, I wish I'd made that beer? <laughs> oh. Hmm. That's tough. There's so many, there's so many good beers out there. Uh, you know, locally, I guess you, let's start there in Hamilton. I really love a lot of beers that uh, Fairweather's making. Uh, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to try Fairweather stuff, but uh, I think their, their IPAs are fantastic. Lately, other than that, it's tough. It's tough. I don't know. You stumped me. I have to think about that. A lot of I, I really like a lot of left field beers as well. They're fantastic. Uh, the ice cold beer is just delicious. It, it's a crusher, it's super good. Um, Clifford Brewing. I really like Clifford Brewing. Uh, their Devil's Pale or their, their Devil's Punch Bowl. Their dry hop lager I think is fantastic. And everything that uh, all the lagers that Clifford's making are just amazing too. Do you have to do a lot of work with your water? Yeah, we, we filter it. Uh, surprisingly, Hamilton's water is very neutral and very clean. Um, uh, you, you would think looking at the Iron Mordor from the Skyway that, uh, you know, the city itself is, you know, a very interesting smoggy area with, you know, unclean water. But because of the infrastructure and because of the factories that are here, the water filtration plant had to, you know, has to obviously be able to withstand all that. So we have really clean, neutral water, uh, but we still filter uh, anything. Uh, we filter, sorry, we filter for the chlorine and for any heavy metals or, and rust. On top of that, um, we are acidifying our water in the mash. And then we use four different brewing salts uh, for different, different brewing profiles, whether it's a lager or saisons, kettle sours our ipas of course we very uh we're very meticulous on watching ph and and um and adding the, the brewing salts to ipas and to the lagers specifically saisons are a little bit more forgiving where you're just going to need some calcium chloride or calcium uh or magnesium sulfide to just kind of do some traditional water work but uh, that's kind of that's kind of about it so we use phosphoric and lactic acid to acidify depending on the brew and then, yeah, just a few brewing salts. Do you have a particular style that you love to brew? Oh, uh, you know, kind of a kind of a little bit of everything. I know that's cliche, but since we've hired our new brewer back in August, he's really kind of lit that fire again of just like childhood excitement. You know, IPAs though, I find. Um, as cliche as some people might think in the industry or you know a lot of people hate on ipas they're some of the hardest to brew uh everyone traditionally would say lagers because of the clarity that really only that comes with time and temperature and, and if you really own a filter then hey that's even easier but ipas you're measuring the ph almost every 15 to 20 minutes in the mash you're also trying to balance a grist ratio of like almost 50% wheat or oats, which a lot of times traditionally these brew houses weren't made for that. Traditional brew house design in Germany is made for lagers, right? So you're jamming three times as much grain in with super adjunct heavy gluten based uh, cereals and grains. That's a challenge already, right? So on top of that, you're looking at soft pillowy water. So we're using a lot of calcium chloride and we're also using magnesium sulfate uh, calcium chloride i think is a very fascinating chemical it's obviously all natural um, and it's used in a lot of times it's used in baby foods and foods that you don't want sodium in uh, america's looking at it a lot because of their lower sodium diet is what they're trying to push uh, potassium chloride if you could imagine uh, salt being a, a level of like one saltiness calcium chloride is a 0.6 so it's still a flavor enhancer but you're not consuming the sodium it makes a big pillowy mouthfeel when you're brewing ipas as well which is super important but these chemicals also help with uh, the haze stability so you know what we're seeing coming into the fermenter is not just going to all of a sudden look like a lager four weeks later 
it's it's about hay stability and you know everything that science has taught us about brewing since the 1960s on from you know the big production facilities um is all about clear beer and how to get your beer as clear as possible and shelf stable chill haze like everything in between that is against your beer getting cloudy now modern times we are looking at how do you make that cloud stay and i remember being at sawdust i talk about this a lot is i remember seeing sam corbet uh the brewmaster there turned to me as we were working and you know we're still really good buddies and he, i joke about it still as he turned to me and showed me a picture of i think like tired hands or some some brewery on the east coast obviously vermont show with a hazy beer and he was like this isn't finished like this doesn't this is product that we throw down the drain you know this looks like crap and he was so offended and i was like man if you had hair to pull out you would have but like he just it was a new way of brewing right so everything against everything goes against the history in terms of ipas right now and obviously with west coast in the last 10 years we've been looking at backbone of bitterness how to get more bitterness into the beer how to get close to that hundred IBUs. Now it's all about soft pillowy mouth feels with a little bit of juice. And yeah. that's a big thing. On, and then after that, it's uh, the hop ratio. The hop ratio is a really big thing on top of pH and the grain. Uh, we're looking at like 3.5 to five pounds per barrel. So quite a lot of hops going in into a brew. And that's also you know gonna create a big juice bomb, but it's also gonna assist with the stability of the haze. So as much as like people slander making IPAs and blah, 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 they're, they're gimmicky. I mean, they've been around for longer than we want to admit. And also they're evolving by as science teaches us. So, so I think that's the, they're most, they're most difficult. Uh, and then on top of that, I think stouts, stouts are one of my favorite to brew, not necessarily drinking one all the time. I, you'll rarely see me with a stout unless it's, you know, below 5%, but they're fun to brew with and they're a great learning tool. So when I'm trying to teach someone or show someone in the brewery, we'll throw a, a, a stout in the recipe of the schedule. So, you know, you can splash around in a lager all day and not see how dirty or how, how far your footprint goes. But when you're mucking around in dark grain and dark wart all day long, your footprints are everywhere. Your splashes are everywhere and it teaches you really to be clean in mind where you're watching, where you're walking um brewing's all about covering your tracks and knowing what you touched last and how clean you are and how many gloves you've touched you know and it's it's wild it, it, it there's a lot of people doing it in in a i mean they're making still good beer but like a lot of cleanly practices like i think that's the problem when you when you look at the industry of like uh educated brewers and and scientists versus just like home brewers or someone that uh you know, just open, open the brewery and we're going to, we're going to make beer. But like, well, it takes a lot of effort to, to remember what every little detail you touched. Right. So a stout is a great way to, to learn that for sure. Second breakfast. Second breakfast. All right. Yeah. We're on that. We're on that. Second breakfast is definitely one of those, like it's still in the sour category. However, uh, it was one of those cul fun culinary questions that just popped in our heads. Um, the original idea was using all natural buttermilk. And the idea comes from original days of kettle souring. Kettle souring is not that old in the brewing industry. Souring in general is, but kettle souring process is maybe only like seven or eight years old. And some people were using yogurt back in the day um, to at least try and get some lactobacillus into the wort to then sour with lactic or to make lactic acid in the wort. Uh, this idea came from, I forget what I was reading. I don't remember. I was learning about buttermilk for some weird reason. And uh, we were like, what if we use buttermilk to lower the pH of the wort before pitching the lactobacillus? And the, the idea is that you want to pre-acidify or add some lactic acid to the wort prior to pitching your lacto because below 4.9 pH, an enzyme will be denatured or it'll be like kind of killed off or slowed down. That'll ruin head retention later on. Sours already have a really hard time keeping head retention and it's not always gonna be perfect um, because of the acidity of it. And if you kind of bring this pH down before 
the lacto starts, it'll help reduce that enzyme from de degradating the proteins to collapse the foam. And on top of that, lacto also wants to kick off at a certain pH. So the lower it is and it's happy place, it'll really kind of work its magic and create as much lactic acid as possible. So that was kind of the thesis or the hypothesis on it. And once we did some research, we realized that buttermilk wasn't actually low enough on the pH scale or acidic enough to, to lower the wart, yet it still had a natural lactobacillus. So still using buttermilk, we were able to inoculate the kettle uh, with lactobacillus to create the sourness, but then we had to pre-acidify using lactic acid before pitching that. I hope that wasn't too confusing. Now I'm kind of confused myself. And then we pitched it to Jeff Broders, who's a really good friend of mine at Indy. And one thing we both really like doing is eating things. And so we were joking about what collab would we want to work on together. And I just pitched this idea that we were jo joking about at Merit. And again, taking that culinary approach, you know, of course, because the kitchen's across this, the hallway from us, we had our chef make up a bunch of Belgian, uh, buttermilk Belgian waffle mix. And so he cooked that off and made a whole bunch of waffles and we threw that in the mash as well. And then uh, sweetened it with some blueberry syrup or sorry, not syrup, uh, blueberry puree, maple syrup, and just tried to really mimic a nice like candied waffle, something that wouldn't be good for you in breakfast time. Intriguing. Yeah, I don't know. What, uh, it's not, you know, we were kind of intrigued ourselves I guess you could say and we weren't I was hoping for I don't know we don't really know what we were hoping for I'm just gonna be honest but I think the buttermilk um, really adds kind of a smooth creaminess to it the blueberry helps round it out and then there's like a hint of a little bit of like a maple syrupy waffle tone to the back end but it's mostly it's kind of candied really but it's one of those things that you know this would probably just be a fun experiment that will talk about and learn from our mistakes sometimes you you had me at second breakfast the minute that i saw that name i was like okay i got it sweet <laughs> yeah we we're always joking uh if you ever met jeff at indy or seen him around he's uh six foot eight uh and just a a large guy you know and uh, my joke is that if we both walk into the bar together no one, and i walk in behind him no one knows that i'm there for half an hour uh, we just, you know, cast a big shadow. He's a great dude. He's been a, a good buddy of mine for about 12 years now. And uh, we want to have fun together. That's the whole thing, right? Brewing is supposed to be fun. And it's about the collaboration and, and the hangout on the day and then enjoying some beers together afterwards. But uh, if you ever met Jeff, he is, uh, he's always thinking about dinner when he's having supper is what he says, you know, he's always thinking about his next meal. So second breakfast seemed very fitting for, uh, for this collab. And yeah, I guess it is kind of like a, a cross between the pastry stout and sour for sure. So I'm curious, <clears throat> with um, all your experiences brewing at Garrison and there at Merritt, um, do you have a, a funny beer story that you would be willing to share with us? Oh my. um yeah I've, i like sharing stories i just gotta remember them i guess you know hmm that's a tough one off the top of my head i've uh you know it's like again the cartwheel syndrome yeah let me let me think about that i'll, I'll get back to you okay that's good what music do you listen to when you're brewing oh a little bit of everything. Um, now that uh, Alex is in the brew house, we're, we're getting a little bit more modern, a little bit more rap focused. Uh, but uh, I love uh, I love anything with horns. Give me give me some Chicago. Give me some Steely Dan. I'm into that. Love uh, love some good swing. Love just old music. I don't know everything. Uh, everything. You know, I'd love to say everything but country, but I'm okay with country as well. Like, Old school stuff, nothing too new, I guess. A little bit of everything, I guess, yeah. What's a um, couple of the, <clears throat> I gotta find the right wording here. What's what's a couple of things that you're tackling right now at this moment? 
like at work at per- personal personally no <laughs> you you choose which one you want to review oh well um yeah let's see we we've got a lot on the go at work for sure yeah we've got a puppy here he's uh, 10 months old tomorrow he's 10 months old tomorrow so he's been uh, been a good dude but he's you know a lot of learning it's been fun um yeah let's see at work we've been growing we're working on a, a new project uh, at our warehouse it's going to be kind of like a temporary event space and and a weekend bar as well but uh, it's kind of needs to also be a a working a working place that we can evolve with itself but also utilize to create our project and keep our projects going so i think that's been a big challenge um over covid i was working with and still am working with uh the community fridge project here in hamilton it's a project that was started in california but i think it was brought to toronto during covid as well where uh you know people were building pantries and installing little fridges and allowing anyone to take what they needed and give what they can as well. So we were fortunate enough to acquire this warehouse right downtown on John and Barton, which is about three blocks away from the brewery. So for us, in terms of driving there, it's so much better than crossing town. And uh, we had, there was a wall in there that we took down and we had some spare wood. So we were able to offer all the building materials to build this community fridge uh we were able to source a fridge and then also have a local artist paint the whole thing so if you ever drive past our warehouse or take a look on our website you'll see the community fridge there it's one of three in town and yeah that's been an amazing experience uh building that hanging out and donating and and volunteering our time to to keep it clean it's volunteered and uh cleaned there's volunteer times three times a day so people check on it inventory it rotate stuff and clean the fridge three times a day, making sure that the proper uh, food is in there, nothing's expired. And it's, it's, it's very eye opening, but very humbling as well to see the amount of use that it gets. I think, uh, you know, sometimes when we're there loading grain into the back of our van, which could take five minutes, could take 15 minutes, it's not that long. We're seeing, uh, you know, two to three individual people or families use it every time like it's 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 constantly checked on every five minutes by someone in the neighborhood because that's what they need and it's very uh it's very sad to see that in a town that's growing right like i was saying earlier so that's been a very rewarding but very very eye-opening project that we were able to to work on and i'm happy that it's there but it's uh it sucks that it's there as well you know getting a lot of support from the community yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of restaurants on James Street are um, opening up and, and donating what they have extra. They're also cooking meals for it. It's one thing as a, as a regular person, like citizen donating, you're not allowed to just, you can't donate meat, whether it's frozen or cooked or anything. You can't donate cooked food. So as a restaurant, we also have the opportunity to cook food, label it, all the ingredients, the date and everything like that, where it came from, what it is. And so we're seeing a lot of other restaurants and just just businesses in town donating uh, their food, their groceries, especially over COVID. A lot of kitchens in restaurants weren't able to use a lot of their food. And we saw a lot of it go to the fridge, which is fantastic. And then coming into the summer months, uh, we're hoping again for a lot of community support for gardens and, and uh, just home gardens. You know, people in the backyard just grew too many vegetables and holy cow, it's, it's, it was very beautiful to see all the homegrown stuff in that fridge last year. Oh, well, that's great. That's yeah, great. but I, but I know from talking with Tez when I was there that you guys are very community oriented to begin with. Yeah, we try our best. You know, of course, business uh, takes a lot out of you as well, but we try to really stay connected. We've always cooked for the YWCA here in town and doing a lot of other donations, um, trying to find always a charitable organization to work with. And you know, this is our town. We we live here. And we're not we're not going away anywhere else to, to live. You know, we see it and breathe it. We walk home. I live 10 minutes from the brewery, you know, so it's a fantastic way to, to build community and, and, and meet everyone walking to work and from work. And without community, you have no support, right? So without them, we wouldn't exist. And, and that's the way it is. That's the way it's gotta be. So I think, you know, supporting everyone first is 
It's more important than marketing or advertising your own business for sure. Yeah. Who's your favorite craft beer bar or restaurant in Hamilton? Oh, well, favorite craft beer bar in Hamilton. I guess you'd have to go a little old school. I really like uh, the brain just down the road from us. Uh, the ship on Augusta street is fantastic as well. And uh, a newcomer, I really enjoy Odds Bar. Odds Bar is a, I don't know, they coined themselves like a hipster sports bar. I don't like sports, no, nor am I a hipster, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> a good buddy runs the bar, and it's also partially owned by the Arkells, who are a local band. And as big as they are <laughs> and as big as they're getting, uh, they are Hamilton people first, and that, that they truly believe in the city as well. So watching that company thrive and they have a good beer selection. They've always got most sports on and on Sundays, I believe they show the bachelor as well. So, you know, you kind of get a little mix of both, but it's a cool bar. Uh, there's also Austin beer hall, which is really cool. It's more of a German feel with sausages and really good foods, really good pickled things as well. So, you know, similar, similar vein has merit, but, uh, it's beautiful. It's a really nice uh, motif in there as well. What do you see that's new and exciting happening in the craft beer industry? Oh, new and exciting. Um, I think what's new and exciting is watching watching a lot of uh, things of like diversity and equality really come to the forefront, really expose a lot. Um, seeing people that have been fighting for it forever and, and and watching the industry grow that way has been a very positive and beautiful experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing those people's hard work really thrive and, and float to the top finally is, is, is beautiful and get the recognition and, and also the pay that's important. Um, I think that's truly one of the most exciting things to see happen um, through this brave noise. Black is, black is beautiful. And other things along those lines are just like, you know, the inclusion is, is so important and, and such a safe space. You know, Merit's always tried to be a safe space for people and, and throughout COVID and through all these exposures and things like that, you know, we've learned a lot too. And everyone is able to grow. Everyone should be able to grow without accusation as long as you're learning the right things. And, you know, it's, it's the best thing in the world, I think, is picking the best people for the job, not, you know, for other reasons and i think it's fantastic I, I that's one of the best things i think um product wise loggers <laughs> summer's coming loggers but you know beers beers always there you know we don't we don't have to talk about beer all the time i think that um people that make the beer people that work in the industry i think that's that's the important part and, and finally you know like trying to change the norm being like oh well i did it so you should do whatever you know it's it's it, that's not that's not okay you know just just going along with the flow and saying well i had holes in my boots or you know we don't do this for that person because whatever you know I, that's that's not uh that's not good and that's not the way the industry should be and i i really like the the exposure of it all for sure well said thank you, thank you. Let's talk about tomorrow. Oh, okay. All right. So tomorrow is Wednesday. Yes. Tomorrow is Wednesday. <laughs> Tomorrow's is one of the first brews. I think it's one of, it's either recipe number six or number nine. Uh, so it was brewed before we opened. And also next week will be brew number 300. So not only on March 28th was our fifth year of brewing. So that was our anniversary. The first beer we ever made was SVP, which is our table beer. Just an easy drinking baby saison really. And this one kind of came after it. So with brewing, you're always trying to use your yeast again. That's the most important thing because every time you brew, you triple or quadruple the amount of yeast you have, but yeast is also very expensive. And that's why you see a lot of breweries using dry yeast. And I just, I don't, I don't like dry yeast. I, I can taste it. I can smell it from, um, if you open a can across the room, I can smell dry yeast in it. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to make really good product, you have to use really good ingredients and yeast is really important to me. And also we're very lucky and grateful to have escarpment yeast labs, which is just in Guelph down the road. So they're fantastic people, a great resource and their raw material is beautiful. I think their yeast is really cool and they're always pushing boundaries and 
So that being said, the first brew was SVP using a French saison yeast, and we kept scaling it up. We we used to brew a beer a little bit more com- more regularly called Shannon. Uh, we are we are bringing that like bi seasonally, I guess you could say, twice a year, three times a year. Um, and then this one here being nine point one percent, it fluctuates year to year based on the alcohol content. Usually, you know, within the high eights to the mid to low nines. Uh, this beer here was inspired first by my mom. Uh, my mom doesn't really like beer. She likes Gewürztraminer and white wine. And, you know, she doesn't really drink that much either anymore. But um, uh, growing up around the dinner table, we always had a pot of Earl Grey tea after dinner. And growing up as a kid and you're isolated, I didn't know that there was any other type of tea in the world. So my mom's tea was the only tea that existed, of course, right? So Earl Grey tea to me was important and it still is important. It's it's my mom. So you know, and she was no, no orange Pico, none of that, none of that crap, you know, it had to be <laughs> real great tea. And I, I didn't know any better. And, you know, we were allowed a few Oreos or cookies to dunk in them, but this beer here is, I made for my mom. Uh, it usually comes out, it used to come out around her birthday, but her birthday is a day after our anniversary and things were too busy. And as well, uh, I mean, so, never too busy for mom, but uh it's also a triple, which doesn't sell as well in the summertime, whereas springtime people still have those, you know, wintry hangout vibes and could warm up with a nine percenter. So that's no problem. And so we pushed it back to the first day of spring because I still felt like that was new beginnings. And when you smell this beer, it's a Belgian triple fermented on French Saison yeast. And also I do believe a triple should be brewed with oats, wheat, and barley. Not every triple brewer believes that triples also can insinuate the alcohol as well but one of my favorite beers is triple caramel elite if anyone has had that before uh it used to be in the lcbo in like the small 230 mil bottles and sometimes i'll go down to the states and grab a few champagne style bottles of it and it's just a beautiful crispy champagne like belgian triple and that was kind of a background inspiration uh at sauna city we used to brew and he's sam still brews uh, princess wars girl pants more of american style and that was a big influence as well. Um, and then this one here is aged, you know, secondary for like just a just like two or three days on a creamed Earl Grey tea um, made by a friend of mine here in town called Monarch Tea Company. Uh, beautiful teas, check them out. They're on online, of course, because it's 2022. And uh, she's she's just a, she's a tea sommelier. She does classes. She does pairings and. She does Zoom chats like this about teas, and it's very, very cool. Uh, Cream Earl Grey, as far as I know, is a simple Earl Grey tea with bergamot, uh, but this one has blue corn flowers in it, and the blue corn flowers bring that kind of sweet Oreo character to the forefront. So I always describe this beer as a Belgian Oreo. So you're still getting that Belgian kind of smell to it, but the Earl Grey tea really balances out to create this sweet creaminess. The beer itself is very, very dry. It's uh, almost 1.004. So that's like less than, I think, half a gram of sugar per liter. And it's very, very light and dry. But the perception of sweetness is coming from the tea itself. Yeah, so that's kind of tomorrow's in a nutshell, I guess. But made it for my mom. I send her some bottles every year. I don't think she drinks them. I think my dad drinks them instead. Uh, but I still love the, the <laughs> joke and the story of it all. That yeah, it's a it's a beer for mom. I like that. Should I ask who's the most influential person in your life right now? Influential. Or we could go, who's your role model? Who's my role model? I don't know. I always look up to my dad. My dad's uh, someone that's, he says he's only going to retire his cars and his shoes and he's never going to stop working. And I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but, you know, it's one of those things if you're smoking cigarettes and you're 98, you probably shouldn't quit, you know? Yeah. Uh, he's he's uh, he's a workhorse and I blame him for my, my work ethic and lack of pausing sometimes, but I think just a lot of my friends, uh, everyone that's been around me f- lately, I just, I'm really pulling from, I think, you know, everyone's banded together. 
my partner Sav, she's just one of the best people to have around as well. And I don't know, just it's a group a group effort and in influencing, I think. And we're all pushing each other because we've all been so isolated lately that uh, you know the, the the little time we get to each with each other, I think, is is just the most important thing. We went uh, we all went to Windsor this weekend for an event that we do at Craft Heads Brewery. And it was Indie Ale House and myself at Merritt, and we brought a crew of friends with us. And you know, it was the first time that we got to you know, like hang out and get a drink together. And it was a two day event, so we really wished it was one to, for for practice, you know. But we we really uh, <laughs> we had a good time, and I think that was just very influence in, influencing. And the times that we haven't been able to go to events or or see friends or the industry people, and you know, these these times these these Zoom chats are so much fun. They've kept uh just kept the smiles on throughout the year and hanging out and in the beginning we did a lot more zoom chats with people and and events like this and it was just it's lovely i think that that kind of that's the influence keeping us going you know seeing the customers come back seeing people come back and seeing our friends again that's just the biggest influence because you you want to put your best foot forward and i don't know i just i miss people so i want to make sure that we're uh we're feeding them, we're, we're giving them drink and we're, we're, we're making them proud as well. I hear you on that. Now, if you could spend a day brewing or chatting about beer, who would that, who would that person be that you would spend a day with? Oh. You know, that's, that's a tough one too. I think there's, there's again, many uh, brewing friends and stuff that I haven't seen in a long time, but I think, uh, hmm, you know, over the past couple, over the past two years or so, we, we've lost some really uh, influential historians of brewing. I think, you know, we, there was a, a man here in Ontario, I don't know if anyone's met him before named Bill White. And uh, he was at Molson's and, you know, the sixties and seventies and was a part of kind of why, how we brew today, you know, and he was one of our, one of our teachers at Niagara and he was a true raconteur. He just, he would taught history course, but I'm pretty sure he just told us about his life for the entire semester. And he, you know, he, he looked like Burl Ives from the Christmas special. He was the snowman, you know, he floated around and was like, he'd tell you a story. And then 20 minutes later, be like, Oh, but I digress. I digress anyways and he just keep talking but he had the same mustache he had this beautiful white curly mustache and he wore a vest like i'm not joking he looked like burl lives from from that christmas special but uh yeah I, I would i would brew with him i would i would definitely brew with uh with him the i don't know there's, there's been some really cool people that uh that i'd love to brew with that's that's a hard one Well, I'd like to end with the funny story if you have one now. <laughs> oh, let's see. That moment of oops where you were so glad there wasn't anybody around to watch what happened. <laughs> oh, let's see, there's too many of those too. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, I don't know. You, you stumped me on that one, I feel. I don't know. I don't know. I feel uh, I shouldn't be on the spot here. I just, I, I usually got a, at least two stories. <laughs> Anyone that knows me tell, that will know that, uh, you know, I'll start a story and then I'll tell you five stories just to get around that. And then I'm like, wait, what was I telling you the first story for? Um, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to thank you for taking okay. time out of your busy schedule to <laughs> chat with us. And I'm going to shut the recording off and then you'll probably have the story for right? us. Okay? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Anyways, Aaron, thank you for joining us tonight and sharing your story with us. It's been excellent and we've had a great time talking to you. Oh, thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, remind everybody next week, Mark from Catalyst is on. Um, those of you in KW, make sure you let Derek know I am because I dropped the ball on getting the, the, the whole thing in process, we'll be making a drive up to Bracebridge to pick the beer up so that we have it on time. <laughs>